So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on another Brujula Chats. Brujula is a joint effort by Veoleo and Entre Dos podcast to help families navigate life at home during the quarantine. I'm Alexis Ruginas, co-founder of Veoleo, a company dedicated to creating Spanish Latinx content that celebrates Latin American culture and heritage. Joining me today is Paula Nino and Monica Leal, founders and hosts of Entre Dos podcast. We hope that you have been enjoying the series and would love to hear from you with any comments and future chat suggestions. Our guest today, I heard, I just heard weird feedback. Our guest today is Marina Chaparro, a bilingual registered dietitian, diabetes educator, and founder of NutriChicos, a nutrition family practice in Miami. Marina specializes in teaching kids and families how to eat healthy and create a healthy relationship with food. So she will be sharing her knowledge with us here today. Welcome, Marina. And remember, <laughs> and remember that you can send in your questions uh, using the chat box to your left. We will be leaving time at the end to answer them. So welcome. We I'm very been, happy to be here, guys. Thank you for inviting me. No, we're we're so glad that you were that you were free and that you had time. It's it's a mental break for me. So I I, I welcome it. <laughs> That's what Paula and Monica have been saying since the beginning that for them this carves out like an hour in the day when it's okay to have the door closed to like yes. make tea it, you're gonna drink it while it's hot and everyone like okay you you emerge from here being like oh i had a good conversation and, and you get away from like the mommy hat or like la nana or like the cleaning lady right. so it's like you're in your your role as you as me marina taparro founder registered dietitian so right. i love talking about that and especially with you guys with some cafecito. virtual cafecito <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's exactly Exactly. So I guess I, a question that I hadn't prepared for today, but how is, what, can you walk us what, um, like one of, I mean, are you still working? Are you still seeing clients or patients? So it's interesting. Uh, okay. Previous to, so Nuzri Chicos, as you said, it's a bilingual practice in Miami and I have my office here in Miami, uh, but I've also seen patients virtually um, and it, I've had it for about two years. Um, and so thankfully, because I've had that, I've been able to kind of lean more on that, but I'm definitely going to have to adjust just like everybody else. I'm probably thinking of now just going a hundred percent virtual. Um, right. and I've been thinking it for a while, but the, 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 the clients that I have been seeing or that were like halfway through, I've been able to see them through zoom or, or, or Skype or whatever. And I've, I've actually gotten more clients as well online a few that were in El Salvador a few that were in Colombia so that's that's been surprising but but yeah I mean just like everybody else I think I'm analyzing you know where where do I go next what's like my next chapter right. um but thankfully I think this is going to be something that it's going to stay and I can still do it I mean I can still talk to 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 parents to to families to you know help them in their daily struggles via via this right I mean it's such an interesting practice because the times that I've needed a nutritionist I have actually I mean I'm based in New York mm -hmm. but I have actually called the nutritionist back home in my hometown in Cali because mm -hmm. for me what's really important is that the dietitian that I'm speaking to the nutritionist that I'm speaking to understands the the base of my diet mm -hmm. I don't want right somebody who is not familiar with our culture to not understand why I consume so much corn and potatoes <laughs> and I want them to understand why no I'm not gonna ban arepas and no I'm not gonna ban a juice right like maybe I'll make juice without sugar right but I need you to understand that jugo and mango is a part of my diet and papas are part of my diet yeah you know so it makes right and like the and a lot of the physical interaction with the nutritionist but sometimes like the the measuring and the weights is like something that if you tell your patient how to do it right like I think they can at least give you really good approximations so it's an interesting practice to be able to take virtual. And it's also when, when I tell my clients, you know, my husband's Venezuelan, I'm Mexican, I eat tortillas. Like I just had a burrito with huevo and, 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 and uh, jamón. <laughs> We're like, what? Like you eat tortillas? Like you eat that up? And I'm like, yes. Like that's, that's also part of me. So I think absolutely there's a reassurance of you get me, like you absolutely get and it's not, not only that, but it transcends to, oh, you're also a mom. So you get this whole thing ain't easy. And I'm like, I get you, sister. It's so, <laughs> right? you know, like I'm there with you. It's just, you know, I sometimes have to extrapolate from this is the theory that I know. And I'm like, Marina, remember this theory. So how do I, how do I 
practice it. And so if I find that successful, I think other moms and other families will find that successful as well. Well, I just had un almohana and hot chocolate for breakfast. Fantastic. And I have used your carnitas in a slow cooker <laughs> in <laughs> recipe more times than I can count. And I stand by it. I recommend it to anybody. <laughs> so anyway, so we can, I guess, formally dive in. Um, I guess a good segue, right, is that you mentioned that you're having more clients now. Is this, I'm assuming that this is because more parents have been picking up on either uh, stress that the children might be under, that it's good to like maybe nip it in the bud now, or maybe ju it's just the time that they have for the first time in a long time to think about, um, you know, we're now planning three meals a home at day, <clears throat> three meals a day at home for seven days a week. You know, maybe only a couple of those are now um, takeout. So is what, what are most of the questions that you're seeing? I mean, I think I'm seeing a lot of things. I think just like I was talking to another friend, it's, this is just more than, you know, COVID-19. Like this is letting us exp like really dive deep into how we eat, you know, and, and also even just like really knowing our kids. I know for a lot of families, like we're really getting a sense of working with them 24 seven. So you're having to really understand like, wait, they don't eat this, they eat this, this is what they have for snack or they're constantly asking me for this. So I think one is that deeper understanding of our kids in nutrition, but also in other aspects, that's one. Um, another thing that I've been seeing and it not only for kids, but the anxiety, right? Um, I actually seen this a lot in my practice before. And, and when, when families would come to me, they're like, Marina siempre me dice que tiene hambre. Me está constantemente pidiendo algo de comer. <laughs> and this is the struggle, right? Because they're always, you know, asking for food. Right. But a lot of the times, I'll say 90% of the times, it's kids are unable to say, hey, I'm anxious, you know, sometimes as we, depending on our relationships, right? Sometimes we're tired, we're frustrated and, and we go towards food, which it's somewhat natural. But when kids constantly say that, then we need to start thinking, wait a minute, is it you're truly hungry? I just gave you something. Is it that you're bored? So how can we, first of all, identify what's going on? Because you might not be hungry. Right. Um, we know that's like a pacifier. That's like the easy way around sometimes, you know, we're busy, we're like in meetings and we're like, just, just have this. Um, but I also think this is a good opportunity to kind of start teaching some of those maybe even coping mechanisms and say, okay, wait, let's, let's listen to our tummies. Hmm, what is it saying? Um, could we really be hungry? Are we sad? Are we frustrated? Maybe we're bored. Maybe we can go outside and kind of like change that, that cycle. So I've been seeing a lot of that. I've been seeing parents who are struggling with I'm, I'm hungry and I'm constantly having to, you know, give snacks. Um, so part of that is going to be on really acknowledge, acknowledging or recognizing which part of the day you tend, your kids are tending to be hungry. And that's usually like around three, four o'clock, like right before dinner. So then we focus on, okay, could we then really have focus on the schedule and say, what is, how are your meals? Like, are you having a really light meal for lunch? Could we make it a little bit heartier? Or in fact, why don't we always include a snack? So it's not a, maybe we'll have a snack. It's going to be like, we're always going to have a snack. And it's going to be a snack that I call a hearty snack. Una merienda sustanciosa. Porque yo sé que a esa hora te da hambre. So, so it's really trying to, again, it's analyzing, it's understanding kind of what the issues are and trying to find solutions that might work for you. But every family is different. I mean, I definitely think that I see that at home all the time because the person you just described is my husband, <laughs> so, right? Like that's, that's what you just described. Tengo hambre y no sé por qué. Tengo hambre. And it, when is it? Not, and for him it's 4 p.m., but it's also 10 p.m. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So sometimes all of a sudden our charcuterie board appears at 9.30 p.m. Yeah. And, and it's the same thing. And we are both different. We both have different relationships to food, right? So I don't eat when I'm anxious. I eat when I'm bored. He eats when he's anxious. Right. And so right now with the quarantine, we have been in, in different working schedules, right? Like I'm working nonstop. So I have completely stopped snacking. Interesting. It does, like I am down to three meals a day and like, that's okay. it. Um, he's been really busy, but he's also been home. Right. Which means that maybe his lunches have been heartier because I also think that I have reverted 
yeah. the schedule that I grew up with, right? Like I want yeah. a medium sized breakfast. I want a meal at lunchtime. And then I want a super light dinner. Correct. So it's also kind of like paying attention to that internal rhythm. And I guess like honoring it to, you know, not to sound cheesy about it, but to be like, okay, like I understand that this is what you need and when you need it. And, and now that we have the time, but I also think that it's a weird time to be learning that because we've, we've always known this about ourselves, right? Like I'm not, I'm not saying anything that I didn't already know. Um, but it is interesting to see how stress affects all of us. Right. So what that. other, other than always being hungry, like how, what else could be changing with a kid's eating schedule right now when they feel stress, stressed out? I mean, I think, and, and part, just to kind of uh, connect also with what you were saying, it's the lack of physical activity. I mean, when we're trying to focus on anxiety, the solution really is physical activity in kids. That's where, I mean, when you see a kid that's, you know, doing swimming or it's in a competitive sport, you're hardly are going to get that, mom, I'm hungry, because you're tired. I mean, you're going to go to bed and you're like, done. And now we also face that challenge, right? So kids are not, you know, they're not going to sports. They're, they might be active, but it really depends. So that's another caveat really to consider that, Part of this anxiety is you're bored. Like you're not, you're not draining those energies. So that's another factor to consider that. And, and part of it, you know what? It's, it's also being kind to ourselves, right? These are crazy times. And I think it's, it's really unrealistic for moms, especially to, to do everything right. To, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's also really being kind to our, to you as a mom and, and really trying to do the best that you can. And, and it might not look like a perfect, you know, a perfect everything because there's no such thing, but maybe focusing on like really small things. So another thing that I've seen a lot is, you know, kids are, are always at home, right? And you're always cooking. So how can those two merge in a happy marriage right how can you use that time for at least to kid for your kids to be exposed to cooking or what a meal looks like or what preparing of the food looks like um and not everybody you know not everybody likes the kitchen right and that's another challenge that we're seeing you know moms and, and, and parents or dads are, are we're having to cook all the time and so what is what what if you weren't a person that like to cook like how do you manage that and that's tough but i think it's just even the thought of introducing what a family meal could look like and and listen alexis and paula me family having family meals at least twice or three times in a week has been shown to reduce obesity Okay. Wow. So I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, like let's, you know, no, I'm not even talking about the meal composition. I'm just talking about the fact of eating together has a huge impact. And I mean, as Latinas, we, we grew up with it, but right. maybe now it's time, like you're saying, it's time to kind of, maybe we we're, we're reverting back to what, how we used to grow up, or maybe that's how we did. Now we have a little bit more time. Right. That is to say, not all of our meals are going to be with the soda mm -hmm. mesa and like, you know, the, it's not going to happen. But that's one of the, the goals that I, that I always emphasize. If we could do one meal a day together or two meals a day together, um, that's going to be huge. And even, okay, if you can include them in the kitchen, could they set up the table? Okay. I, and I do the bowl. And my, my daughter loves to cook with me. Mm -hmm. um, but I said, okay, agarra el mantel, agarra el cuchillo, mm -hmm. agarra el plato. So kind of it's really teaching them other things of life, of whether you want to do schoolwork, of mathematics, of, of you know, whatever you want to translate it, but also using the kitchen as, as a method to, to teach them that beyond the class, beyond, beyond the, the textbook. Right. So going back for a second, when, let's say, for example, <clears throat> you know that you, when you get stressed out, you become a, a stress eater and you know that right now you can't have the physical activity that would normally be your outlet right like what do you especially since you're so well versed in this right like do you ever catch yourself falling into that mistake of maybe being like maybe just mo not modeling the right attitude towards food or you know like how do you stop yourself from falling into that so it's it's interesting that I've 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 kind of started to be in the space of there's no right or wrong 
Okay. Um, it's, it's more of, you know, this is how we're doing. Sometimes we do this, sometimes we do that. So it's, it's not moralizing food. It's not, I'm going to be tempted to eat chocolate. Like I eat chocolate every single day, <laughs> but I eat this month. Right. And it's just part of, part of my life, part of what I like to do. But at the same time, that's also teaching somebody balance. So that's an interesting thought of when, when people, when people see that my daughter has chocolate, how could you, I mean, how could that be? I said, my goal is not to restrict kids, is not to put kids on a diet, is not to use tricks, is not to use, I'll give you this if you do this, but it's rather allowing them to understand the concept of what balance what moderation and what enjoyment is because I want her to understand that she can have the chocolate. If her body is asking for the chocolate, have the chocolate, but guess what? She's going to have a tiny amount because right. she can have it every day. So there's no restriction involved. There's no, why are you getting the chocolate? You're such a bad girl <laughs> doing this. There's no, you know, there's no, ay mama, mama va a pecar. Oh, oh, sí, mamá, mamá yeah. se salió de la dieta o oh, oh, mamá no se está portando bien porque se está comiendo el chocolatito. So, so part, really part of like what, what I try to do in Entre Chicos is really, and, and you, tell, you said in the beginning, the introduction is to develop a healthy relationship with food. And it also comes down to our own relationship with food. So that's been, that's been huge in a lot of the parents that I talk to because they're used to saying things like, ay, me veo bien gorda, or ay, ya voy a mañana, voy a empezar la dieta, la dieta keto. And guess what? Their kid, their daughter, their son is going to do the exact same thing. And, and right now, I mean, there's, you know, sometimes there's chocolate. Yesterday we made banana bread. Of course, it's using healthy substitutions here and there. But when you are starting to teach kids how to eat stuff, you know, and foods in a balanced way, uh, it becomes less tempting. It becomes like, oh, I can have a cookie. Okay, well, I don't want a cookie right now. I'd rather have a fruit. You know, like that sort of game plays. Granted, that takes time. That takes learning. It's it, that de depends on your own relationship with food. But those are things that once we come, once we're aware of, it's like, wow, Marina, yo no, yo no he dado cuenta por qué mis hijos estaban comiendo así, porque parte es lo que yo estoy haciendo, parte es mi mentalidad, lo que yo pienso que está bien o que está mal, lo que yo he hecho. So it's all of that together. What so, are some ways to, to speak more? <clears throat> you had some examples on your Instagram account. And, you know, I think we all as moms fall into, you've had too much sugar today, or if you don't eat, you can't have dessert. Or, which it's back to language and that damages that relationship to food. So just what are some examples of turning that around into a positive so that you speak like in a better way about food to them? So it's always, uh, and, and you said it, it's language. It's really how you present stuff. It's really how you talk about stuff. So rather than saying this is good or this is bad, you know, just having the approach of this is food. Um, a lot of the times versus saying, you know, this is good for you, you know, broccoli is going to be good for you. That's one of the, one of, that's one of the, like the, the errors that all of us do. It's like, es muy rico, es buenísimo para ti, es bueno, cómetelo, nutritivo. As if, you know, as if they're in that mental development to say, absolutely, you know, it's going to, it's going to maximize my skin. It's going to make, you know, they're like four years old, like. So studies have shown that studies show that the more you tell them like health messages, like this is good for you. They're like, eh. so instead I, I like to start teaching families instead of you saying, this is good. Ask them questions. Oh, so how does it feel like? How does it taste? How does it, como se siente? ¿verdad? ¿A qué huele? Mm, como a qué forma se parece? So describe it to me. So kids love the whole exploring. They're like, ay, mira, mamá, se me sabe eso, huele a esto. So I say, ay, ¿a qué te supo, Malucia? ¿Te sabe picoso? ¿Te supo dulce? So what are they, what are they gonna do? <laughs> right? Like that, that's, they're like, this, so it's, it's really starting to use 
how does it look like? I, depending if you have an older kid, I, where does this food come from? Well, actually, this comes from Italy, or this is this comes from um, China because this, or this is a dish that they do here, or so it's kind of describing it versus saying, "Listen, it's good for you. It's good because they're like, uh, uh-uh, I'm not gonna eat that." So this is fascinating because. Two weeks ago, we interviewed an early childhood development uh, expert about mindfulness techniques. And so much of what you just said is the whole mindfulness aspect of, you know, if you have a kid that's attracted to the kitchen, like how you get them involved, right? It's like, close your eyes, feel the orange. What does the orange feel like, right? So that's fascinating that that's just like a tip that carries over. And it's so interesting because I do think that so much of what we learned about, about adults when we try to look into our own relationship with food is, yeah. is the fact that a lot of us don't eat mindfully, right? Like you're eating quickly, you're eating standing up, you're eating over the sink, you know, like you're just like stuffing something into your mouth while before you go. So it's so interesting that it kind of like always comes back to yeah. trying to be as present as you can with them um, while they're tasting. I mean, I hadn't thought about that at all. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, and once we start teaching that from the beginning, I mean, it's the, re- and I always say, why do I focus on the relationship? Because I think nowadays I'm really concerned that we as individuals are constantly talking about diet. Like we're diet central. It's everything is about, you know, X or Y diet. And that's carrying on to our kids. And you don't know how many families I have that because they do that, they, they do it themselves. They're like, well, this should be healthy. Therefore, I should be giving my kids paleo pancakes. <laughs> and and I, I think that's just, I mean, it's normal. Like I would be confused. Like, I, I mean, if, if I'm doing it and if it's advertised as, you know, being healthy and why not my kid having it? Well, guess what? Your kid's an athlete. Your kid is playing soccer prior to COVID like four right. times a day for two hours. And guess what? He wasn't growing. And that's why they came to see me. And when we started to look at everything, it was like, oh, you know, we started to change the the arenas to more like other stuff. And I'm like, wait, but but why? So it's yeah. that's the part that is is really is really sad for me that whether we like it or not, we as parents, we as adults are having an impact because whether we're talking constantly about diet, whether the way we see foods, the way we see it ourselves, the way we say, you know. So it's, and they absorb all that. I mean, I think it's, it's fascinating also just how much of this is cultural for us, right? Because there's nothing more ingrained than the Catholic dichotomy of, you know, good and bad and guilt. And the fact that you can see something that is pleasurable, that is enjoyable, that maybe is a cause for connection with, you know, a family or a friend and to, to automatically put that in like a sin, like peque, que yo peque, right? Like, and then you're not enjoying it, right? Like you just had pizza, but the entire time you had it, you just felt horrible, yeah. right? So like, what's yeah. the point, right? And even as adults, if you wanna have like a cold, crisp, you know, beer, right? Then have your beer, enjoy it, and then move on. <laughs> and not- a lot of the times what I, what I then start seeing is that kids start to sneak food. Yes. So parents come to see me a lot of the times concerned that, you know, they're finding all these plastic wraps of, and I'm not going to say like unhealthy food, but like maybe of certain snacks that they would have find the only thing that they would, that would find. And when I start seeing kids either overindulging and stuff or sneaking food, that usually comes from a place of restriction. Right. Um, So when we restrict kids, whether they're hungry or not, which is really interesting because kids will most of the time only eat if they're hungry, right? There's a few things, unlike adults. I mean, adults, we have other issues going on. <laughs> adults, you know, they're very, they're very succinct. They're very, um, you know, como que están sincronizados. Yeah. So when we start seeing kids that are either, you know, overindulging or binge eating or doing some other kind of weird behaviors, it usually comes from a place of restriction. So we need to say what's going on at home, you know, what are we doing at home? And sometimes when we allow that, so for example, I did this experiment and I said, you know, I, I should put all foods are equal, right? Some foods might give you, like I said, algunas comidas te dan más vitaminas que otras, mm-hmm. pero 
podemos comer unas aquí y allá, pero todas las comidas te dan algo. Hay unas comidas que te dan más vitaminas y otras comidas que no dan tantas vitaminas. Mm -hmm. so that's another way of kind of phrasing it versus saying good versus bad. You know, some, some foods provide you with more energy for your car and others might not give you more energy versus good or bad. And so um, the experiment that I did with my daughter, I said, okay, in one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give her, let's say like, um, uh, I had, I think, nuts with uh, chocolate. Okay. Um, she loves. And instead of saying, no, you can't have that, I say, I'm going to include that as part of the meal. So there's less temptation. There's less anxiety. So I said, Emma Lucia, ¿qué quieres hoy? And this just to give you an example. ¿Quieres right. las nueces con chocolate o quieres tu manzana? Okay. Of course, she likes, she likes the chocolate. She was, so she's going to say, las nueces con chocolate. I said, okay. So you're, you're allowing, you're, you're, allowing for that to happen you're removing the restriction you're removing the taboo you're removing the temptation and you're just saying they're equal whether you want to have an apple or you want to have a chocolate now okay it's my decision i'm deciding when i'm giving you what but you're choosing so i, I did that one day i'm like okay let me do it another day okay day three ¿Cuál quieres? ¿Quieres una galleta con chocolate, una nuez con chocolate o quieres unas eh, fresas? Ah, no, las fresas. Ok. So, when they know it's part of routine, when they know it's not something that I need to earn, something that I was good, therefore I had some chocolate, something that is not prohibitive, then she's like, oh, I can have that all the time. I don't want that anymore. I want the strawberries. Right. So, then I started to see the shift. And that's, that's an interesting technique that sometimes I, I would tell to, to, my, to my clients that if they start noticing a lot of anxiety, a lot of, not anxiety, but a lot of overindulging or binging or hiding food, I said, why don't we start allowing some of these food in a, in a you know, in a, de una manera, digamos, eh, limitada, o sea, es decir, Tú sigues diciendo los horarios, los días, no es como que ellos están agarrando lo que quieran, no. <laughs> But if we start to include them maybe as part of a breakfast, maybe as part of a lunch, what are you telling your kid? That, you know, these are equal. Chocolate is not better than the other. Right. They're just equal. Sometimes you might have more of them. Sometimes you might have less. But that's, that's the whole premise of intuitive eating. That, you know, of mindfulness of everything that we're talking to. Right, that they can take a second also and just be like, well, yeah, what do I want? And sometimes she'll want the strawberries and a lot of the times she'll, she'll ask for the fruit. Uh, other times she'll go for the cookies and chocolate, but she's not doing anything bad. Like she's not a right. bad girl. She's not, she just likes both of them and she's learning how to navigate that in, in a balanced way and a moderating way. Right, so what do you do though, for example, if, I don't know, like, it, what, would we, what would happen if right now you realize that Emanusia is already turning to food as a coping mechanism, right? Like, maybe you hadn't realized it because you're, you know, you're a busy parent and they eat most of their meals at schools or what, you know, whatever. Like, you, and as you have just realized this about your child, or maybe this is the first time that really triggers them in that way. And like, right, like, this is the first time that they've been faced with something this tough and all of a sudden you realize that they're eating their feelings or that they're not or maybe they're not eating their feelings maybe they're not eating at all Como que tal vez les va el apetito. what do you do so i think in in that case there's a couple of things that we can do um and and i think overall i think you know each kid is going to be different and mm -hmm. again sometimes there's also a fear or an anxiety based on your kid's weight right so if your kid is a certain weight then you're also going to be like super worried. But a lot of the times I've seen kids, you know, that are, you know, bigger frame and they're both their parents, you know, son, son de hueso grande. So that's another kind of bias that we have to consider, right? Okay. Once they do have a kid that is, you know, a very anxious or very emotional either. I think we as parents, we're still in control of the meals. Like okay. We can't forget that, right? We're still in control of what we buy in the supermarket. We're still in control of, okay, breakfast, lunch, dinner. So I think it's, let's take back that control. And maybe we're, you weren't used to it because they had breakfast at school, lunch at school, maybe some snacks at school. But now I think having a schedule is going to be 
key because either you don't have a schedule, kids might not thrive, especially the young ones. Or if you don't have a schedule, the old ones are going to be snacking all the time. So really taking into account, okay, being as prepared as you can by having a breakfast, right? Two to three hours later, they might need a snack. So a lot of the times families might have like a list that they create together. So this is going to be the list of snacks that we have, especially like for older kids, right? So, and we include them. We can say, um, manzanas con crema cacahuate, nueces con chocolate. We might have some yogurt. So it's something that they're already involved. So part of this, Alexis and Paul is going to be getting them involved, right? Letting them be part of the process because if they're not into it, no matter how much you do, it's not going to work. But I think by having a schedule and saying, this is breakfast, this is going to be lunch, this is going to be dinner. And if I'm realizing, like we said, that at four o'clock when you're playing video games, that you're really, really kind of looking for something, why don't we do a snack right before that's going to be a heartier snack? So instead of just allowing that to happen and saying, it's going to happen anyway, being a little bit more preventive and saying, let's do this instead, that's going to be more healthy. So having that snack ahead of time. And the last is going to be, so even for, for, for some of that kids that have been doing, have been, you know, anxious, um, they've started to do some type of yoga. Like I do yoga mm-hmm. with my daughter, like right. a frozen yoga. It's not anything like fancy, but it's like a frozen yoga. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's including in, 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 in something so they can drain uh, those emotions, but it's not going to be, I'm going to get the food out of the way. It's on the contrary, it's having scheduled meals that of course you can have the snack. We're just gonna have two options of snack. Maybe one day you, you can decide, but I'm always gonna say, ¿Quieres el yogurt o quieres el pan con crema de cacahuate? So you're still the one that's providing those meals. It's, it's not like they're cooking them. You're still that person. So um, I guess the other question, I guess, I don't know if we should jump ahead or, or we'll get there because I guess one of my questions is what does getting them involved in the kitchen look like for different age groups, right? So if you have, my, my nephew has a, a Montessori tower. Uh-huh. So yeah. the Montessori tower is something that my sister has been able to like prop him up in from a very young age. Like I would say almost since he learned how to stand really. So he like, he loves it, right? Like he knows what's going on. He helps. You know, if you, we've made arepas with him, we've made other things with him, but so what does that look like the older, you know, the older they get, right? So, and it, I love it because all, every kid, like if you, every kid loves to play in the kitchen, like if it's Tupperware, if it's like utensils, they just like love making a mess and getting in there. Or even if you buy them those like play kitchens, right? right. So I'm always thinking like, why is it that we buy these expensive kitchens, but we will not allow them to play in the real kitchen, right? We, we, we keep right. it off bounds. And I think that's part of the Latin culture. Like, mijito, no te vengas a la cocina, la cocina, vaya para allá. Usted no se viene para acá. Para afuera. And it's also part of, you know, you know, we don't want them to get dirty or we don't want them to make a mess or, and I get that, I get that. But, but also just letting go of that, Ay, se va, se va, se va ensuciar, o va a ser un desastre. Yes, but have a separate station that you know he's going to make a mess. So, so don't, so kind of thinking of the younger kids. So with Alicia, who's about to be two years old, she of course wants to help because the oldest, which is three and a half, wants to help. So I give her a little thing that she can play and do her mess, but it's her, her own little way and not necessarily like we're, we're doing it but she's not necessarily you know helping me pour stuff because she's not that 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 old um so for little ones things like depending on their age like pouring right um it would be like washing so you can put them in the in the like a little stool they can wash vegetables um they can wash potatoes right um even from a very early age, um, in my in my Nutri Chico's page, in, in my I have like an Amazon affiliate, um, and I have a lot of different utensils that they can right. use. So, even plastic cutting boards. So things like tomato, they're going to be really soft or really soft fruits. They right. love it. so so chopping some of that up. Um, other things that we like to do with younger kids is, for example, painting. So if we know we have let's say some vegetables that we're going to grill, 
So painting them with olive oil and vinegar, right? So mm -hmm. you're doing some of that painting involved. Fine motor skills. Fine motor skills. So again, right. this yeah. is all like Montessori. It's like yeah. practical life and, and they teach you like pouring. So for example, if you're going to be doing some type of baking, you know, they can get one batter put it into the other, right? Or for example, they can whisk potentially an egg. So you'll be surprised how much skills they're able to do. And this for toddlers is super, super beneficial because of the motor dexterity, right? So it helps them their motor skills. Um, for older kids, right? they could do a lot more. So for example, they could, they could do definitely much more cutting, right? They could do a lot of the cutting. A lot of the times if they're not into it, things like just, okay, let's put the table in. Just let, let me set the table so you can do it. For what I've seen in, in my older kids, for example, is they like more of, I want to choose the recipe that we're going to be doing. Okay. So for example, let's say we have, you know, some ripe banana. Uh, so it's more so, okay, so it's now your turn to choose the recipe of what we're going to do with this. So it's giving that autonomy. Um, right. I mean, right now we can't go to the supermarket, but I love going to the supermarket with kids because you'll be surprised. They're like, what is that? And what is that? I was like, okay, let's, let's try to figure out some recipes and you're going to choose the one that you're like, that you're going to like, and you're going to help mom do it. So it's giving that, that, that autonomy to actually cook something that they're gonna do. And we know that the more involved they are in the kitchen, guess what? They're more willing to try it. So I think to answer your question, I mean, the older they are, they can do more complex things from, for example, if they're gonna be doing multiplying to do a bigger serving size of the meal, you know, they're using their math skills right there. Right. Um, or like temperature, kind of figuring out temperatures and amounts uh, because food, food is a science. Like, the art of creating uh, meals is a science, whether you're doing bread. Um, but, but really, it's any of, if you have a kid that's not been involved, doing the things that I mentioned before, so like the washing, so especially if you have a, a kid that's not really like a fan of, let's say, broccoli. And they're like, Marina, mi hijo no come broccoli, no come broccoli. Bueno, invitar a la cocina que no coma brócoli, pero quiero que lo lave, quiero que lo corte, quiero que le ponga aceite de oliva, quiero que le haga todo. Y te aseguro que después de que haga eso 10 veces, cuando se lo pongas en el plato va a decir, wait, so I, like, I did all of this. <laughs> what do you mean I'm not eating it? Oh, okay, and, and so that's the part of involving them that I'm not expecting you to eat it. If you don't want to eat it, that's great. I'm still presenting to you in your plate. You're still seeing that. I'm not forcing you. No te estoy diciendo que, mmm, es que es muy bueno. Te vas a <laughs> it's there. We're all eating it. But if you helped me actually cut it, put some olive oil, you were touching it with your hands, it becomes familiar. It becomes a friend. And that's what we want our kids to be like, oh, you're my friend. I gotcha. Yeah. You're gonna, and, and, and that develops over time. It's not, you know, it's that's, not. That's really, that's really interesting uh, because we had that issue recently with our dog. <laughs> not to compare, not to compare anybody's child to a dog at all, but, but he is, you know, a 50 pound dog who recently went through a, a time of being bored with his food. <laughs> and when we spoke to the trainer, the trainer said, make him work for it. Uh -huh. Make more for it. It's not a piece. We changed his food. Like we tried everything. And I was, I was worried because I was like, oh my God, he went from eating on this great schedule. And all of a sudden he's not, I was like, what is going on? So we asked a bunch of questions. I looked at YouTube videos. I spoke to the vet and they said, make him work for it. Get, don't, don't just put the, the food on a plate. He has to, he has to look for it. He has to find it. It has to be in the con. It has to be frozen. He has to lick it until he can get out. And then he's happy. Did we change anything? No. Did we cover it in something that was more appealing? No, it was literally just his kibble with water. The only thing is that it was now more like the, the engagement with it was a lot richer and then therefore more rewarding. So I think it's fascinating that this is the same, the same thing, the same aspect. Um, and even a story that I, that I, that I put in my, in my Instagram, so <laughs> I, I love my, I, I love mushrooms. Me encanta los champiñones. Okay. And I wanted my, my daughter to like them because I like them. Like you should like them because yeah. I like them. Um, but I swear I, I would give it to her in a very small amount, always in her plate. Right. And she'd always just like, look at it and be like, touch it. And I'd be like, no, and I'd be like, okay. Right. <laughs> so, like, 
So we did that, I would say probably for the first like year, year and a half. And I was like, okay, I know she's not gonna like it. Um, and we would always include her in the prepping. And one day we were prepping, she was helping me cut the vegetables. I think I was doing some sauteed mushroom. She, she was helping me cut the, the vegetables. And all of a sudden she grabs the raw mushroom and she's like, oh. <laughs> and I was like this, like, my, my my world just stopped and I was like mm, trying not trying not to be like super excited but like mm, yeah get the soup ball. she's like mm, sabe como durito. She, I don't know what she was saying she was trying to like explain to me I just turned around and I was like oh my god this just happened after literally two years of me like presenting it and making like a huge beautiful dish that we would all eat and she'd be like and all of a sudden she was cutting it she ate it raw <laughs> i documented it and it's on my instagram like so it happens guys after two years it happens that's really funny though that's really funny um so one of the things that i really like about the kitchen and i think it's something that i've appreciated i guess maybe now right like right and you know these times more than ever um especially because with Beoleo I have to do all this research about you know different ways that you can present Spanish in the kitchen how it can help how you can reinforce like other academic subjects right so the kitchen is like the epicenter of STEM education right and that, that's something that I think a lot of parents don't think about so you know you can have them cut and multiply and divide and you know whatever and I have very fond memories of the kitchen because I am not the STEM example right i am the human arts example the you know the the so not the human arts the what am i looking for the liberal arts, arts the liberal arts example so for example i remember my grandmother letting me peel potatoes wash and peel potatoes and i just remember i think being it, that it was like so cool that i could use a sharp tool you know like that's what that was like the peak for me but i also remember hating it when my mom gave me tasks that i wasn't necessarily a fan of so when my mom made lasagna my task was always la salsa de bechamel and i was always like why why i don't want to do this but um you know we always liked to bake and we always you know did, and something that i was always attracted to was uh using scraps so growing up somebody taught us how to make torta de pan which i don't even know if torta de pan like translates right but it's literally old stale bread with milk and an egg and right like maybe something else you can add like a banana you can add some rum you bake it it's delicious like i absolutely love it so for me the kitchen has always been a place more of like you know once you have the science down it becomes more of an art right so and now especially with everything that's going on like i'm growing scraps i'm growing scallions out of the scraps you know i'm i pickled radishes for the first time yesterday i pickled uh red onions for the first time this week i've learned more about what goes into pickling right there's just like all these different things that you can learn about and it, it's everything, right? It's it's baking and gardening and STEM stuff and knowing where your food comes from, right? And if you appreciate the food, your food's journey, then maybe you're gonna be much more open to it and thankful for it and appreciative of what it can do for your body. So have you found yourself including more of these things or maybe recommending that as part of the strategies for your parents, like maybe trying to have a vegetable garden? I mean, absolutely. So it, we always think that eating is gonna happen in, in the kitchen. And a lot of the times it can be very, a, a very pressured environment, a very like, we're all sitting together, the expectations that you're going to eat it. So sometimes the table itself might be a place where we're constantly fighting of, or like negotiating with your kid, or you're not eating this, or you're not eating that. So I like to step it back and say, how do you expose kids with food, not necessarily at the table? So that could be at the supermarket, which is not happening in the garden. I mean, that is a beautiful way for kids to even interact with food and where it comes from. So when I think my goals of, and, and granted, not everybody could do that, but there's maybe even herbs that you can do it and we'll get into that. But when I first moved into our house, um, my dad always had a veggie garden. My parents have been like hippies. <laughs> In, in their own way. Um, my dad always had a vegetable garden and, and all of a sudden he would make like a green pasta. And I was like, what is this? Oh my God, it's green. <laughs> it's like pesto pasta that he, he did from the garden. I was like, eh! <laughs> um, 
so I knew we all, I knew I, I wanted to have that. So ever since we've, they've been little, we've had a vegetable garden. Um, sometimes more things come out of it than others. But for example, tomatoes, the fact that we've had tomatoes since, since they've been very little, they just adore and love tomatoes because it's now my younger daughter's conquest that when we go outside, she better see a tomato. <laughs> it's green because she's going to eat it. So she's like in a quest. She's like, dun, dun, dun. I was like, you can't get the green tomato. <laughs> but that's like her thing. And even, for example, with herbs. So depending on, on, on what season we would plant, we always had herbs. And so teaching them kind of, different herbs so she would now she starts grabbing one <laughs> she's like hmm romero and i'm like <laughs> oh, what a snob <laughs> she's, she's like mm. organic <laughs> she's like hmm but for example having for example and, and she said something interesting she grabbed the basil and she's and again using those descriptive words a que sabe está picosito está she's like oh it's sweet He's like, absolutely, sweet. It's sweet. We're actually going to do a sauce with it. So mm -hmm. the whole concept of where food is coming from, um, having to water it, you know, you develop um, a, a nourishment and, and it's also, you know, sensory. Right. A lot of kids, depending on what age they're in, especially in the toddler years, they might be aversive to certain textures. For example, if your kid doesn't like strawberries because of como lo raspocito, uh -huh. you need to get them an it exposed to different types of texture. So that's what's called occupational theory, occupational therapy. So right. a lot of very sensitive, very picky eaters, that's more than just your regular, might need some type of occupational ther therapy, which is playing in the sound, in the sand, um, getting your hands dirty, playing with dirt, using food to kind of get messy. So that's why we always say they need to, they need to get messy with food because it's part of their learning. Um, and so I just find it fascinating that now, you know, my daughter understands, you know, even just the concept of herbs. And, and now, like a few, a few months ago, she went to a, a neighbor's garden and just grabbed or whatever, <laughs> como una hierba. And she's like, I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, that's not real food. And she's like, every, any green stuff that she sees, she believes it's like una hierba. And I was like, no, 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 no. Well, um, I mean, she might not be wrong because in our farmer's box last week, we got dandelion greens, which we have never heard of or used. <laughs> and we're like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll find a way. We'll find a way to use them. Even um, if it's just in you know, an apartment, you know, having some type of herb that you know you can get at least some sunlight. Um, and and uh, so can you, pick, can you pick it out for me? We're going to do a pesto or we're going to do a pasta. Why don't you grab a few, a few flowers? I mean, you're giving them tasks. They're being independent. Yeah. They love that. They love that. I mean, I love it. I see my scallions grow and it's so nice. It's yeah. so nice to know because it's, a, it's the relationship of nourishment, right? Like I'm going to nourish you. You are going to nourish me. But it's also, I guess, delayed gratification, right? Like it will it will start to grow. It's not going to be immediate. But when it, it when it does happen, it will be rewarding. I'm in an apartment in New York, right? So I have one window so that gets a bunch of light and right now we have oregano uh, oregano mint our basil is in rehab yeah. um the scallions <laughs> and and so little by little and now i mean now we're, that we're pickling things like that's also wow. really fun and it, yeah it's also really fun because it becomes different colors right like the pickled onions go from red and white to like magenta in like two minutes once they're like being pickled. So that's really fun too. Um, but no, I think it's all really exciting. I wish I had space for more of a garden. I don't know how good I, I would be at keeping up with it. So but um, but I do, I mean, I also think it goes such a long way, right? Like if you can grow something and then you also know how long something takes to grow, right? Like if you understand the journey of a, or like the, the, the timeline of the life of a tomato, right? Then you're gonna be more willing <clears throat> when you even, I mean, now and when you grow up you're, to use all the tomato, right? Not to throw any bit of it out. You're going to try to use every part of the animal that you're eating. Um, and you're also going to be so much more respectful of, of the outdoors. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like it, it just, it, it's just the kitchen is such a great, or food, I guess, it's just such a good starting point for so many different lessons that, I mean, it's great that so many people, I mean, I love that regrowing 
scallions from scraps is like a trend. <laughs> I love that this is a thing on Instagram right now. <laughs> um, okay, so what about, I, to wrap up, what the, before we move on to audience questions, what do you, what recommendations for parents that maybe just the kitchen is not their thing, they don't have creative ideas about how to, you know, include the kitchen. They barely want to cook. They can't believe that all of a sudden they're, you know, fending for themselves three times a day in the kitchen. What do you resort to? I mean, what what are your most used tools, for example? I mean, in that sense, I think it's it's definitely tough, and I think there's no way of escaping it now because you know you're you're kind of forced to to cook something. Um, but I think even just the more prepared you are, the less overwhelming it could be. And, and granted, I mean, it could be so simple, but even, for example, I know a lot of, of my friends that, that are dietitians as well, might provide like some free meal plans just to, I know a lot of people need ideas. Like, I just don't know what to do with this. So, I mean, using Pinterest, using Instagram to really get some ideas on like snacks on what do I do with all these like for example I had a post not too long ago on frozen foods right mm -hmm. um uh, frozen foods can be entirely healthy they don't, they're not necessarily like the bad food and they're very economical so kind of we you need to be in a position that you need to be open to learning and I think there's tons of amazing resources that are out there that are willing to give you ideas that are not complicated that are not for like the super chef but they might involve you know five ingredients that might be foods that are like frozen foods um you know two days ago I grabbed some frozen vegetables I grabbed some frozen fish and I had some avocado and that was a meal um you know and that's that and other days, you know, if it's like a Friday, your foods might not be as elaborate. You know, I have some moms that are like, today is going to be cereal and an egg. And you know what? That's going to be okay too. But I think it's understanding what your weaknesses are. I think it's huge and saying, I'm not good at dinner. I could do breakfast, but I'm not good at dinner or lunch. Mm -hmm. So trying to get some of those ideas, trying to be as prepared as you can. If you're working, then maybe doing something like a crock pot, you know, crock is going to be your best friend that you can do some carnitas, that you can do some chili, um, that you can do some beans, that they're not going to take as much time. Um, nowadays, I mean, there's even books on crock pot ideas or like it, the um, air fryer, which I don't yeah. have an air fryer, but I know mm -hmm. everybody's like, you need to get an air fryer. It's like less time. Um, so, so I think it's just being open to learning new stuff, uh, getting the right tools and, and I mean, just, just doing it. There's no wrong in, if, if it doesn't come out perfect, that's fine. But unfortunately right now, you are going to have to do some type of cooking or at least having a plan that Fridays you don't cook or Wednesdays you don't cook, right. whatever it is, you, those days are you do take out, that's fine. But as long as there's more like of a, that you seem to have a routine, I think for us moms or dads, I think that's helpful for me to have, to know I have a plan. I mean, we use, we do because of, as, as we mentioned, like I like a, you know, good breakfast, a bigger lunch, and then like a smaller dinner. Um, dinner, a lot of times when we're, if we're busy, it's hummus. We know that it's hummus. We know it's baby carrots and we know it's pita bread. Done. There we go. We don't even, we don't even put the hummus on a plate. We like eat it and we're, it's healthy. It's filling and we don't, nobody feels bad about anything and we're done. Um, and then at the same time, I also feel like we are big proponents of, you know, eggs right so like egg omelets for dinner eggs you know, we make egg burritos we add vegetables we add all sorts of things and when it comes to the frozen vegetables i mean there's nothing easier than making rice adding frozen vegetables to it and then maybe scrambling an egg into it done mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, okay, it's the easiest thing ever but anyway so i think it's relearning that, it's relearning those concepts is it's because you're having to um then yeah no, I mean, all right, so Paula is going to take over for the audience questions. Cool. Sure. So, okay, so I'll start with, I think there's two that are similar. Um, my toddler only eats certain foods, despite us offering him a variety every night. How can we help him or her eat a variety of foods and stop negotiating? Um, like for example, what we were talking about, like if you eat three veggies, I'll give you chocolate or something. And how long can I expect it to take once 
you know, you start introduce for them to like a food. So interesting um, keywords, right? Negotiating uh, mm -hmm. and toddler. <laughs> 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 they're like don't go together <laughs> they go together <laughs> but I think, uh, there's various ways maybe I'll mention two of them but number one picky eating accentuates in toddler years once you know that you're like oh it's not about me I'm not a bad mom it's this is normal and expected so just like you know stranger anxiety that we see just like teething I want parents to start seeing this as a normal behavior because why? They strive for independence. And number two is that they're afraid of food. Before, I always say, él comía de todo. Mm -hmm. no me quiere comer nada. Because he sees things and he's like, what is this? This is <laughs> He didn't know better before. <laughs> this is really unfamiliar. This is scary. So it's what's called neophobia. That happens usually around a year, two years, and even three years. So once we understand that, we're like, Okay, I get it, but I'm not gonna negotiate with you. So number one, I would say if we can involve them in the kitchen or in a less threatening environment, so you're not stressing, you're like, cómetelo, te va a gustar, va a ser bueno para ti. So if we can involve them prior to the actual table, so whether it's a supermarket, whether it's the cooking, whether it's the vegetable garden, so that exposure is probably gonna be even more important than the actual food, the table exposure. That's, that's probably one. Um, and the other one would be, I want you to continue presenting it, right? I don't want you to negotiate. I don't want you to bribe him. I don't want you to say, si te lo comes, te voy a dar eso. Treat it like any other food, right? Um, even smaller amounts might be better, less overwhelming. And we also, I also did a, a, a post yesterday on what's called the bridge food. So if you introduce a new food with a familiar food, they're gonna be more likely to eat it. For example, we did bacon. So bacon with Brussels sprouts, if they're new to Brussels sprouts, can be a fantastic way for them to try them. Um, for example, if they like chocolate, right? If they've never had nuts, it could be chocolate with nuts. If they like chips and they've never had hummus or avocado, it's pairing those two. So it's bridging the new and the old to include them um, or introduce them. And it could take it could take a while, right? Uh, there's genetic differences in eating behavior. Some kids might be more selective uh, than others. Some kids are more adventurous than others. Uh, understanding that just like some kids are foodies from the beginning and they like enjoy and love food and others could be like, I could care less about food. I mean, I might eat it when I'm hungry, I might not. Um, but it's also understanding that aspect and just being patient because it, this eating and learning to eat, it takes time, it's a journey and it's not a final destination. Mm. Did that um, neophobia you mentioned happen sometimes in older kids? And I and I mentioned this from my personal experience. My my daughter, I feel like she ate so much more when she was younger. More more variety. She still eats variety, but there's a lot of things she doesn't eat. But there's also um, she doesn't like to try new new things very much or she'll have a bite and she's like oh yeah it's fine but if you present it again she just won't touch it and she's the type of person who I could give her a sliver of broccoli and she'll just pick it off and put it off her plate so and I feel like a lot of the strategies that are given for toddlers they just don't work as well for older kids because she's like yeah well it smells great and blah blah but it's it's almost like I know what you're trying to do here I'm not gonna try it <laughs> I no and the same thing with mixed foods like yeah. for example she loves chicken noodle soup, but she'll sit there and mm -hmm. take all the time she needs to pick out every carrot and every little piece of celery that is in the chicken noodle soup. And it, I mean, for me, it's frustrating to see because it's like, come on, you, you, you've you eaten a carrot. It, she's probably eaten it hidden in the noodles and chicken and hasn't even noticed. But if she sees it, she takes the time to just, you know, take it out. Is she the type of person that likes to, that is like very organized or is, it, is she the type of person that like to get dirty and kind of like hearing about? Uh, 
I mean, I, she, yeah, she probably doesn't. I think when she was younger, she was more into sensory things. Now it's mm. now she does have a little bit more of, Ugh, I got this on my hands and I need to wash it off type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so I know there are people who eat separate. My husband is one of them. He likes to eat rice first, yeah. meat second. I mean, he does make some things, but I'm, I'm always like, I don't get it. <laughs> so you I mean, what about mixing the food is delicious. It's like, but no, like he's very organized sometimes when he eats, unless it's, let's say a curry or something, which he likes to serve over mm -hmm. rice and mix it up, you know? So, so um, you mentioned an important thing. It's, it's genetic. I mean, a part of it and part of the, 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 the time that I see picky eaters you know, mom or dad had a history of being very selective eaters when they were young or very thin when they were young and their kid is now thin. And so, you know, part of it is genetic predisposition or if they're constantly seeing that, you know, with their mom or dad, good or bad, you know, part of it could be learned. So it's, it's going above because what you said, you can't trick them because mm -hmm. once you trick them, you lose all trust. And so mm -hmm. next time you try to pre present something, they're like, aha. So that's why I'm, I'm, I mean, and, and see me with us, with us adults. I mean, we can say when I was young, I didn't eat this, but now when I am 30 something, I eat this. So sometimes for some kids, it could take a while, but I don't want that relationship with food or that, you know, family dynamics to be tainted of this, is what you need to do, this, is what you need to do, but it's more of let's continue having that positive relationship by you could you help me out in the kitchen could you help me out of the grocery store could you get dirty with it could you prepare so using those opportunities to get her involved in without expecting her to eat it but rather you're that's fine you're not gonna eat it but you're gonna help me prepare it type of thing yeah and I think sometimes there's that um we fall into okay you have to take at least one bite and try it and tell us what we think and I think that fills it you know then the pressure is there already the there then then I know this is what you expect and guess what I'm not gonna do it <laughs> okay um what uh tips do you have for and I guess this kind of relates it might be similar but for children who don't eat a lot um should parents still have this clear your plate expectation or an expectation that they eat anything at all if they're just not eating so i mean it depends if they're not eating just in one meal or if they're eating if they're more on the thin side um i mean it, th that question could could relate to uh, many different yeah scenarios. i i but guess I so what, what's the balance when do you worry well so for example let it go the but so, well so for example when i was younger i was always on the thinner side probably like in the small like on the the lower end of percentile. percentile part of where my pediatrician and my mom wanted me to be and my mom would just, she was worried like she just thought I wasn't eating enough and I don't I don't remember being a picky eater I just didn't want much mm -hmm. right and so from a Colombian family from like you know Bogotano grandparents that literally just want to feed you ajiaco and sancocho and caldo de costilla you know like and they want to see cheeks on you I just think that she just felt like, oh my God. And I was fine. I wasn't hungry. I was fine. She wasn't going to take my word for it though. Yeah. So is, I know, and I still grew up with like the, I don't have to even tell you about the children that are hungry in Africa because there's children that are hungry around the corner. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think that the answer is when do you worry? So I see a lot of parents that are worried. My kid doesn't eat a lot. Okay. Then we start looking into, well, it doesn't eat a lot according to whom, <laughs> according to you, to what your idea of what your kid should eat like. So I start worrying when I see a deceleration. So kids are born, they're genetically disposed. Some kids are going to be in the highest percentile because mom and dad are very tall, right? Other kids might be under, in the, in the under, in the lower percentile. But they all, the goal is that they should all be growing at their own pace within their own curve. If for some reason we start to see that that is not happening, right? So they're starting to lose weight. They're not starting to grow. Um, then that is when I, wear, when I worry. But the reality of things is that a lot of kids 
are going to be continuing to grow in their own percentile. Granted, unless there are some sensory issues, mm -hmm. um, you know, underlying medical conditions, most kids will grow at their own curve. So if your kid didn't eat dinner for one day or for two days, that's fine, right? That's, he's not going to starve to death. He's not going to, you know, he's not going to lose weight. What's what we know, especially in toddler years, some days they could eat 500 calories. The next two days they can eat 1200 calories. I mean, it's just, they're very erratic in their eating behaviors. And I think as parents, we're like, yesterday you had nothing. Like, what is it? You just wanted X or Y. And all of a sudden this day you're eating everything. So they're very erratic in their eating patterns. And sometimes that's normal. But as long as they're growing within their own curve, I'm not concerned. Um, granted, if, you know, if they're eating appropriately or they're not having any constipation, that's when we do like a deeper dive. But the same thing with my daughter, Alexis. I mean, yeah. my, I've always been very thin. My husband's super thin. Like he has a very thin um, body frame. La, con and, la contextura. <laughs> la contextura, exacto. <laughs> and uh, she's, she's all her life, she's been in the fifth percentile. Okay. All her life. And she eats really well. I mean, it's not that she doesn't eat a lot. She eats really well, but she eats enough to meet her needs. Right. And that was a learning lesson for me, being a dietitian, saying, oh my God, what, what do you mean? Like you're in the fifth percentile. And then my pediatrician would say something saying, we just, you know, let's just watch out. Let's see where she is at. And then later on, she's like, Marina, she's perfect. Like yeah. she's just going to be in the fifth percentile. Just let's, let's, let's assume that is. But mom, grandma and grandpa were like, I said, yes, that way black. You're like, that's yeah. just who she is. And there's a reason because your son, AKA my husband, <laughs> super thin and I was super thin. So it's kind of letting go of that. You know, we all want them to be a certain way or we all want them to be in the 50th percentile and nobody's exactly proportional. As long as they're following their own curve, that's something that I, that, that would be my benchmark. Okay. Um, and aside from some of the things you mentioned about, you know, just getting in the kitchen and getting dirty, are they, are there other ways in which you can work on food texture issues? A lot of it's, again, not necessarily using food. So for example, a lot of occupational therapists might use, for example, sand. Um, so playing with sand. So if a lot of kids, let's say when they go to the beach, they're like, oh, they don't like to get their, their feet dirty that's a sign that they're maybe overly sensitive. Um, for example, paint, right? So if we could do some paint in their hands, a lot of times then we can involve what's called like feed, like food play in which you involve food, for example, to play. So for example, let's say you grab a broccoli and that's like your utensil. So you're actually touching the broccoli, feeling the broccoli in a non-threatening environment because you're not expected to eat it. This is just to play. So let's say you have like a, like a, como un caballete and mm -hmm. a paint and you get an asparagus and asparagus is going to be your pen. Oh. So that's what's called food play and very, and, and kids that are very selective that have a lot of issues with scent, with, with textures, very neophobic. It's using food as something that's not threatening because maybe they see food, they're like, oh my God, you're going to force me. But if I'm, we're going outside and we're getting dirty with it then you don't need to fear that that's the same concept with with cooking right usually cooking we're not expected we're not expecting them to do anything we're just cooking so that's why it's a positive um experience but i would say sand i would say um paint uh and some kids they might work with let's say like washing teeth or they might be somewhat aversive to like um to the hand or or, or the face or the mouth um, but there's various, I'm not an expert in, in occupational therapy, right. but if you do seeing some of those, he's just not normal picky eating and he's like four or five and this is not going away. And there's other kind of things that we're noticing. Um, then you could definitely see an, an occupational therapist and they're going to work with sensory and that's thus going to help with the food, which doesn't make sense, but it does. That's so interesting. It is. Um, and I guess the last one, um, so right now, you know, we're in lockdown and it's, it's kind of a time where we have a captive audience in our children in the sense that we're here, we're cooking, we're, they're not eating at school, they're eating most of their meals at home. In fact, my sister-in-law subscribed to a fish 
box where she gets oh. fish center and she was saying how her kids are now trying scallops and all these things that they would have never nice. eaten before. um so so those are some ideas but at the same time a lot of people might not have access to the same variety of foods because we're restricted in movement and also maybe budgetary considerations um so do you have any advice there and maybe how to continue to offer that variety to kids and expose them, but within those constraints, like maybe is there some, you know, are there some budget friendly ideas or that sort of thing? So that's been trending. Um, it's budget friendly and it's like shelf stable. Uh, right. So I think those are two important considerations and going back to the frozen section, I think, um, we could utilize that a little bit more and not be afraid to include like spinach, edamame, corn, uh, any of the fruits, right? So a lot of the times fresh fruit can be more expensive, but the frozen fruits are equally as healthy. A lot of the times they're packed uh, or they're freeze dried at their peak nutrition quality. So whenever blueberries are at the peak, you know, state, then that's when they're freeze dried. Then, so in terms of nutrition we're gonna be almost the same. Um, other things to consider, I would say, is thinking of foods that's gonna last longest, right? So um, you don't necessarily have to go to the supermarket all the time. And I know, you know, fresh produce might be difficulty, uh, but thinking of like sweet potatoes, thinking of, you know, if you're, you are using, let's say some of these uh, herbs, if you could store them you know, in a plastic bag that's nice and, 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 and dry or a little humid, but with some paper towels, that's gonna extend the life double. Um, things like Brussels sprouts are gonna last a long time. Um, things like uh, sometimes putting like bananas in the fridge is gonna last a long time. So a lot of the times it's maybe just like certain tricks that you can do or what you were saying, Alexis, is, okay, so now I have some zucchini that I never used what do I do with it, right? So it's if it's in a baked product, uh, for example, apples. Uh, apples they take a while for them to to you know to be old. But we did apple chips, right? They're perfect because they're nice and dehydrated. Uh, you put them in the oven; they're nice and crunchy and crispy. They're a fantastic healthy snack. Um, using smoothies, if they're not, if like for example, so my strawberries were a little yucky and my raspberries were a little yucky. So today we all had a smoothie. Uh, so it's, it's, it's also kind of being that creative on other budget friendly ideas that you can find that are not going to require you to go to the supermarket every single week, uh, but that could prolong um, the shelf life and they're still nutritious. So, yeah, I mean, that happened, we, our spinach was like looking wilty the other day and like, so it ended up in a smoothie also. And what I think also is that this mentality of like, I mean, I think it's great that more people are becoming more aware of like this waste knot, right? I mean, it's unfortunate the circumstances why we're here, but I think it, that's a that's a good thing overall. And especially if that stays with, with people, yeah. um, but it becomes like a game, right? And yeah. it's yeah. so easy to Google, like, I was like, what can I do with this radish? Oh, we can pickle radishes. Like we've had it before, right? Like maybe with mm-hmm. Japanese food or, you know, maybe at a different restaurant that we went. And I don't know if people know this but if you google um what what can i do with blank the internet will give you recipes Mm -hmm. so you don't even you don't even have to know what you're looking for right like you don't have to say i have an apple and i know that i want a baked good or i know that i want x or i know that i want y all you have to do is tell because i do that a lot when i don't know what how to combine flavors but i know that i have two things that are ripe in my fridge so i say okay i have asparagus and i have you know i don't, I don't know like butternut squash what do i do and the internet will come through and it will tell you like you can make the following five things that all taste good when they're together and you're like okay thanks so that's i mean that's a very easy way because for example i like cooking i like baking like i like doing all these things but i don't have this like fully developed chef's palette where I can close my eyes and say, I know that these two things will these to work well together. Yeah. Right. Like this will elevate the acidity. No, I don't know, but <laughs> it's fine. You know, <laughs> it works out. <laughs> so I think we're done with audience questions, right? Paula? Yes. Yep. All right. So, thank well, you. Marina, thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you guys. Yes. Yes. 
this was great. I think, I mean, I, this was wonderful. Um, everyone else, you guys can follow Marina at, uh, it's arroba or at Nutrichicos on Instagram. She has a website. It's all very, very useful. And she has that Amazon list of tools that are helpful for kids in the kitchen. We actually once did a giveaway with Marina where we did the plastic knives that are in different, it's like a set of plastic knives. So they can cut, you know, lettuce and kale and spinach and bananas and who knows what, maybe even strawberries and stuff. So I think that's also totally worth checking out. Our next chat is going to be on May 23rd with singer songwriter Diana Gameros. And we're going to talk about the healing power of music. And that's about it, everyone. So follow Veoleo um, at veoleo.co at Entre Dos Podcast. We will be updating you guys there and via our newsletters. And Marina, I don't know if you wanted to say something else. Well, it's been a pleasure talking <laughs> to you uh, English and español, así las comunidades, y hablando de tortillas y ajiaco y cosas en la cocina y las abuelas y el peso. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, hopefully a lot of what's happening um, in like what you said is the food waste, you know, the mentality of like routines uh, sticks with us. But, but I think above all as moms, we should be kind to ourselves. You know, we're not, you know, feeding is not perfect. Feeding is not one way or it's not a certain way. Um, and focusing on the positive relationship versus my kid doesn't eat broccoli. He'll get there. He'll get there. He <laughs> might have a different you know, it might take longer than perenganito, but every kid is different. So honoring and, and trusting your kid is going to go a long way. That's well, That's a perfect yeah. note to end on. Yeah. So, no, really, thank you so much. Thank and you. to everyone else, I hope that you all found it useful and we'll see you again next week. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.